Hello, thank you for downloading, listening to, and well, not watching this time, but listening to the Lean Into Artcast, a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when one embarks onto that dangerous journey of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I do interactive storytelling and design. I teach that stuff and coach as well. How's it going, Jersey? Good. It's good to see you. Uh, I know that you know this is a non-visual episode. We do those every once in a while. Uh, it's mostly, but we—I mean, it's got a YouTube video too. But you know, not seeing us actually talking and performing. But so that, that for that reason, I feel compelled to uh, telegraph that there are some other people in the room with us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Can can hear them in our green room. It's it's uh, thin walls. So yeah, we well, have a special event. Hors d'oeuvres. We're the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> special event. Awesome crossover between the you know, Alex Simmons and Chris from the Just Tell the, Tell the Damn Story podcast, and we're doing the Lean Into the Damn Story. This is part two, actually. Part two of so of a series. Uh, yes, a crossover event. So if you are just tuning in now, I implore you, put down the podcast, go back, go to Tell the Damn Story on Anchor, anchor.fm. Um, do a search for Tell the Damn Story. We, we link to it in the show notes. And uh, listen to the first hour so you get to hear me and Rob and Chris and Alex talk about a variety of storytelling topics. Uh, and we ended on a cliffhanger, and we're just going to dive into the cliffhanger. Well, I got to hit the music. Well, first, first, let's talk. With, well, let's uh, introduce uh, our guests. Yes, yes. <laughs> let's do that. Let's. Do, I'm just so darn excited. Uh, so, <laughs> Alex Simmons, you were here not long ago, uh, back in May, in episode 272, creative advocacy on the show. Yeah, creative that's right. Advocacy. I was I was with you then. Uh, yeah, I came to visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, guys, uh, it's it's great to be back. I feel like I'm visiting Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. You know, just <laughs> just come come down the street to Michigan or wherever it is you are, because you guys are in the Midwest. Um, but no, it's great to be back. Uh, Alex Simmons here. I'm a writer, um, uh, creator of a series called Blackjack: African American Soldier Fortune, 1930s. But I've also written for DC and a number of children's books. And I created um, an initiative called the Kids Comic Con. Uh, about 14 years ago, and so it's an event for family and kids every year, but we've also traveled a bit and done a bunch of other things, and we're an advocate for kids and imagination and discovery, and then my my partner in crime on the podcast Tell the Damn Story is... Chris Ryan, how are you? It is an honor to be on the show with Jersey and Rob. I'm Chris Ryan, uh, writer of things, um, checkered sketch, sketchy past from a weekly journalist in the Bronx and New York City to a sketch comedy writer and a Latino comedy troupe and independent filmmaker, uh, writer, actor, producer, co-writer, publisher, actor, all that stuff. And then uh, the stuff, the the main stuff is uh, I've written about four books, a collection of short stories, and also... How about this, fellas? I got the opportunity on at least three or four occasions to actually write the legendary Blackjack character created by none other than Alex Simmons. So, yeah. How you like them oh apples? All right. <laughs> oh That's pretty great. I'm sorry. I think the meds are wearing off on him. But, you know, <laughs> a little time. I tell you what, I, it took a long time to get to to get permission to do that. If not for Badass Mofo Magazine, I may never have gotten a chance to write. Trust Blackjack. me, folks, there is such a public or was such a publication. But th- thank right. you guys that, for inviting us. Uh, yes, you know for the for part two, it's great. It's great. Yes, and in our last exciting episode, we had put a dramatic and moral question to you two intrepid souls. And we wait now for your answer. Okay. Well, then, uh, you know, we have a uh, system that we do here to get ourselves psyched up and also to let the the listeners know when we're into the topic. And I have to play a sound cue that runs something like this. There. Now we know we're fully into the, the topic. Okay. 
So, uh, what what was the the, the dramatic cliffhanger? <laughs> All <laughs> it's, right, it's been um, several days. I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing from it, we were talking about um, the new generation of readers, the new generation coming up, and uh, some of us are in the classroom and uh, coming in contact with them. As a matter of fact, I think all of us, in one way or the another, are in contact with them. And while we may have grown up with the the concept that um, the good guys will win out. That's not really as as widely embraced, or at least it doesn't seem to be as widely embraced in the newer generation, you know, because so many aspects of their life, uh, the hero isn't winning, you know, whether it's one kind of corruption or, or, you know, climate change or this or that or uh, anti-heroes, um, they don't they don't seem to be getting you know wearing the white hat and get, jumping on the horse to give uh, Alex a little thrill and riding off into the sunset. <laughs> they don't think that that's the way to go. So what do we need to do? How do we need to tell the damn story to an audience that is not programmed in the same way that the previous, I don't know, 70 years of storytelling were programmed how do you how do you tell the damn story how do you give hope to people who are pretty who feel quickly, i think you said believe that reality might not really matter uh, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right that was that was the one that that's shook right. me a little bit yeah. yeah yeah does reality matter and one of my classes no <laughs> that's there yeah you make up your own reality and that's that will that changed my curriculum for the and year um <laughs> so all right how do you do your it, guys? throw it out the window yeah. <laughs> well it you know it i tell you what though it galvanized me you know and yeah. uh i'm still searching for a way to to get them to explore that so okay let's throw it in your court Jersey and Rob. That's where we are anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Well, Rob, do you want who, who, oh, match it for it, or do you want to dive in? We're, uh, yeah, we're gonna th- th- virtual thumb wrestle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bur- 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 beep boop. Um, so uh, I'll just start with a, li- a, a few thoughts and and uh, and tag out quickly. So I, I think I mean people express just you know where they're at, the reality of the moment. And, um, I, you like our, our prior conversation, uh, honestly, all three of you were, uh, I really admire how much, um, like vulnerability and willingness to, to share the, uh, you know, like, like channeling past experience and, and the, the difficulties and finding ways to express them and, and whatnot and how you navigated all that. And, and the, and, and I, I typically, Focus on going forward. Make the make the most. Do the best you can with where you're at, and that's pretty portable. I don't have to dig into my past. I don't have to, you know, do that stuff. Where where uh, I don't need to dig out those difficult circumstances. But then days pass, years pass, and now I feel more comfortable and ready. So, like, look, I think of students who are saying, like, well. I don't feel comfortable or ready to believe in hope. That's bleak and super sad, right? Yet, it's their reality with where they're at right now. And that's a snapshot in time. They will progress. They will experience things, probably your teaching being one of a, of a voice that pro- provides a counter, uh, an alternate uh, approach that has the empathy and generosity and openness to provide a context of, well, there's a lot of different bridges to hope. There's different ways to get there. You don't have to eat it all at once either. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there's... So, chances are, the hope will get in. It just may not be there. It may not be... They may not be ready for it right then and there. And I can empathize with that too because I haven't been ready to use all parts of my voice at different times as well. Yeah. I'm I would, sorry. I got to just mention, yeah. Rob, thank you very much. Great title. A lot of different bridges to hope, or many different bridges to hope. That's a great yeah. title. Thank you. I will be using it. I'm sorry. I'm just, <laughs> I like how you turned it into a gift. 
Alex is like, thank you for giving me that gift. I, I will I will utilize it. That uh, was the most polite pickpocketing I had ever witnessed. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I'm happy with it. You know, as you think you when you take something. Yes. I'm sorry, <laughs> Rob. I mean Jersey. Uh, so. To, to to take the the ball and run with it a little further based on what Rob, where Rob started us yeah um and, and I will say like I I share I think a very similar worldview to both uh, Alex and Chris in that if I could say like about we mentioned Lone Ranger in the last episode and if I'm a tough person to watch TV with if you're watching something I really enjoy because I I show up with my whole heart and I was watching the Lone Ranger television show the original like old 50s show was 40s show. Uh, I think it was 50. 49 going on. Yeah. But and the first episode, first episode, like for those who aren't familiar with the story, most of us are, but like he, he's part of this group of Rangers who get put into a box Canyon and these, these bandits like just assassinate them from the rocks above. And we, and then the Lone Ranger is the last one. Tonto, you know, helps, helps him get uh, resuscitated and back to normal. And when the Lone Ranger decides he's going to wear this mask and he's going to go hunt these guys down, he's going to bring them to justice. He says, I'm, give me that gun. I'm going to load it up, but I'm never going to shoot to kill. I'm only going to shoot to just incapacitate because, like, those guys kill. I don't kill. And I fell to pieces. <laughs> I fell to pieces on the couch. I was like, it's like, oh, my God, he's so good, you know? So, like, I have that same sort of bias towards, like, heroes who have, like, who, who telegraph their morality through the storytelling. Um, however... I am also a huge fan of John Carpenter films, and I also mm. love Orwell. Like, or, like uh, Animal Farm is one of my favorite books of all time, and that book has a terrifying ending. It is a brutally terrifying ending. Uh, 1984, oh my gosh, what is worse than that hat of rats that they put on Winston at the end, right? Um and those stories, Franz Kafka, I've read, like, you know, The Trial. And, like, the first line of The Trial is something like, somebody must have been spreading rumors about Joseph K. because for no reason whatsoever he was arrested one day, you know? It's like, these stories are not hopeful in the least, right? Poe isn't hopeful. Um, there's something thrilling about that kind of story. And, and Carpenter, the, the one I always point to is um, The Prince of Darkness, one of my favorite movies. I know it's kind of hit or miss with some people, but... I love that movie. Oh, really? Oh, cool. We got to yeah. talk about it more sometimes. I, lo- I, I find the movie endlessly fascinating for a variety of reasons, but the ending in particular is one thing that grips me, right? And the end yeah. of that movie, it does not end happily, right? It ends very ambiguously, yeah. right? So, I, and I point to that and I go like, okay, well, was, what was it that I was attracted to? Was it that I felt especially hopeless? I'm like, no. Is it that I like the thrill of horrification? Well, maybe that's part of it. But also, especially in the case of like Orwell, and I feel like Kafka to a smaller degree, there's a sense of um, the nightmare, art as nightmare to send a warning shot across our bows, right? Orwell in particular was trying to warn us, don't let this happen, folks. And if you're going to do that, you can't have hope in the story. You have to have Winston at the end completely you know his his spirit utterly decimated because if he if he uh, prevails in that story it diffuses orwell's central argument of the the terror of tyrannical rule right Mm -hmm. um so and 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 so i think that there is uh like when rob is talking about like this is where people are at and there's there's many bridges to hope i also think that um Operating out of a sense of this is that reality doesn't matter and there's there's no sense of hope. I think that's an un, unsustainable standpoint. Um, again, cu- couched in the notion that I've got my bias in that I cry when the Lone Ranger says he's not going to kill people. But I, I feel like it, walking through a world where you are only going to consume media that that reinforces this idea that, that you can't fight City Hall kids who don't even try. Um, I feel like that that can't last for long without some kind of emotional or psychic crack up. Um, so I, I don't know. I would I would push against the premise in that I don't think that this is necessarily a, t- a general swing of taste as it is um, feeding a certain age group or worldview that comes and goes. Um, right. What as as teachers, mm-hmm. right? Besides all the creative stuff we do. Uh, we are those bridges, you know, yeah. so well, I'm, I'm searching for best ways or to best practices, but best ways to be the bridge they need at this moment. If you get a class that the consensus is, 
uh, we're not really convinced that reality matters. There's a lesson plan that's required, right? <laughs> and and that's where I find myself in. And and it, it's an it's an opportunity for creativity, you know. I so know. I uh, since we are working on both in the classroom and in our creative endeavors to try and uh, express for this among the other uh, audiences, this audience as well. I, I I submit to you again. How you know? How do you grab that part of the audience? Ooh, ooh, how geez. do you do it? Ooh, ooh. Can I try? <laughs> um, one one thing, and I don't want to make this as oh, this always works for me, but it it's a standout moment that I've had with a number of my my screenwriting students over the past three years. A uh, certain number of them. My first year, and I'll, I'll try and condense this, my first year working at the New York Film Academy, I met this young man uh, who was from, I believe, China, and he did a film, his thesis film at the end of a year was a story about these two friends, these two guys, went applied for the same job um, and applied and interviewed at the same time, and j let's say guy A is hoping that either one of them gets the job because this is my friend and I want it and he wants it, and it'll be good either way. And as they're leaving the uh, the interview, guy B does some payola with the interviewer to buy his favor and winds up getting the job, moving up through the company. He gets his friend a job in the janitorial service and then later steals his girlfriend, marries her, and they both do everything they can for a couple of years to make this first guy feel like trash. And it's building up and building up and building up until finally he decides, I, I, I got to get even, and I want to get even with my friend in particular, so I'm going to kill her to do it. He'll suffer, she'll be dead, I'll be satisfied. And he goes to push her, he plans this, he goes to push her in front of the subway she uses every day to go home from work, and just as he's about to shove her in front of the oncoming train, he stops. He can't do it. You know, as bad as he feels and as angry as he feels, no, there's a line I won't cross and he walks off, and that's the end of the film. It's a little short film. So I said Coming to the Coming this Christmas on Lifetime. <laughs> yeah. So, so luckily I brought my blow darts with me. Um, so I said to the boy uh, at the screening of his film, I got to talk to him afterwards, and I said, what, what prompted this particular story out of you? you know, so it's kind of curious. And he gets really, very serious, uh, and he tells me that when he was like maybe seven or eight years old, maybe a little younger, back in his homeland, in his city that he grew up in, he and three friends are out in front of his buildings. He painted it as like a three-story building, an apartment building, and they were playing in the street, just having a good time. And from down the street and around the corner comes this huge mob. And at first they thought it was a parade or some sort of simple protest. But instead, it was a gang. It was this huge gang, violent gang. They were striking people down as they went with whatever weapons they had. And so my, this young man and his friends turn to run for his building. One of his friends gets shot. The wow. little girl that was with him gets cut by some sort of huge knife or machete. He makes it into his building, some sort of a slam lock front door, I'm assuming, because they couldn't get to him, and he made it upstairs. So the very next day, he's looking out the window of their apartment, looking down on the street, and he sees fire trucks. And he's wondering, what? What are fire trucks doing there? there were, there'd been no fire. There'd been no flames anywhere. And then he realizes, this young child at that time realizes they're hosing down the blood on the street. Oh, wow. And he said at that moment, in his heart, in his head, however it resonated as a child, he, he couldn't believe that human beings could go that deep into horror that something, some little spark of decency in them wouldn't stop them at the last moment mm -hmm. from doing something so heinous. And somewhere as he was growing, he kept saying, I, I guess he began to realize he wanted to do films or tell stories. He said, somewhere as I was growing up, I kept wanting to do a movie or a film about this, and this was my first chance. Wow. And I thought, if I hadn't asked him, I never would have seen the correlation how deeply that thing had lived with him that his first opportunity, he used this method to tell that story. And I tell this story that I've just shared with you to some of my students when they talk about the things that they want to do and how, you know, where they come from doesn't matter or their, their country's poor or nobody cares about. 
And I, I talked to them about it. And I've watched it happen numerous times that they, this light goes on. And I think the light goes on because it's one of their own. It's someone their age, someone who's, yeah, he's from another country, but he's just like me. You know, he wanted to do this. We're, we, I, we all want to make movies. We wanna, s- f- common denominators, common ground, and peers seem to be a tool that helps to, it, to, to place evidence in front of young people, or most people, that you need to look at this from another angle. You need to think about this. Maybe, maybe let's dialogue about it. Maybe there's another viewpoint. Maybe there's another way. And I think part of it is only getting them to question the, the, the belief they're holding on to or the false notion that they might be holding on to at that time. Just to get them to question. I can't force them to change their minds, but if I can get them thinking about it, if I can get them questioning if mm-hmm. this is the absolute answer, or or maybe are there many bridges to hope? I'm going to so, keep using that. Sorry, it, uh, I, I just want to be that bridge. Yeah, right. And so, uh, if, if I may take that and build on it a little bit, and this is something that Rob and I have talked about off mic a lot, of, and maybe we could even use this as a segue to talk a little bit about like uh, like bringing more celebration into our lives, is that something that secular society isn't super effective at is finding narratives to make sense out of how utterly brutal being a human being can be. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, and that's where art is supposed to fill in that void. Right. And so this is something I would put to the students is like your job as an artist is to help create meaning in this world and define this meaning and express this meaning. And uh, I'm reminded of something Joseph Campbell said in one of his lectures is that, you know, when, when the first eyeballs on the earth opened, what did they witness, right? And the mm-hmm. first eyes fo- were like were fully formed, like they didn't just open one day, but like when they were fully like seeing things, what did they what did they open their eyes to? Life was feeding on life at that point, right? Like for millions of years, li- like life subsisted by consuming other life. And you got to think, what does that do to you? And so he starts talking about like these Native American legends about like the buffalo. It's like, well, we got to kill these buffalo so that we don't die. But that's that's th- there's something in our psyche that says, well, that's wrong. We can't do that. Like we intrinsically, like p- most people don't walk around going like, well, I'm just gonna kill that thing. That's all, right? Like you you there's there's some hesitation there. Like there was this old PBS show called 1800s House where people had to live in an old house and live like the 1800s. Yeah, I remember that. And like when they had to kill that pig to eat it, right? The family has this crisis and it's like, but you've been eating steak and hamburgers and pork chops your whole life, right? Like why is this a problem now? Well, because now I'm confronted with the actual deed, right? There's something hardwired to us that that knows that this doesn't feel right. So what do they do? They build this legend like, well, if we use all of its parts and if we celebrate it with this certain kind of ritual, it's not really dead. It's like we're bringing it back in some way, right? We come up with these narratives to help like psychologically protect us from the horror that we experience as being human beings. And like, and I feel like that is a discussion I would bring to them as well. It's like, yep, you know what? It is awful. It is pretty freaking awful. And guess what? That means that we all have a sacred responsibility to not, I'm not going to be as, as big and lofty as saying go out and fix the world because it, it seems a little bit too big to fix right now. But we can start to help make sense out of it and help shape it through the stuff that we make because when and I and I, I would even point to like we'll do things where we chart villains like okay we're going to come up with a spectrum of villainy from like fun villains to like really scary villains and we're going to come up with like some you know ersatz categories like here's the force of nature villain here's the revenge villain here's the madness villain here's the villain as hero who thinks they're the good guy that kind of thing and we'll just start talking about different villains and like really try to get it like why do they do what they do and uh you know, begin some investigations into like some truly terrible ideas to try to uh, understand, like, uh, and bring to their bring to their attention that your job, if you want to be a, a writer or an artist, one of your fundamental jobs is going to be understanding human psychology. And if you want to, and I, I this is the only time I've ever yelled at my students because it was right after the 2016 election, and everybody came in and they all wanted to do their parody of you know this candidate or that candidate and make a funny comic about it. And I said like, if that's really what you're here for, if you're really here just to like just to like to take a jab at somebody, I guess. Or we could use this as an opportunity to say, like, hey, our job is to really understand how people tick and really understand people that we don't necessarily agree with because that's what a writer does, you know. Uh, 
So you yelled at them while you were saying this? I, I, I hit the board with my hand. I said, that's what a ah. cartoonist does. And uh, and I was like, now who wants who wants to do a funny parody comic just poking fun at somebody? Or who wants to make something that has deep meaning that is going to change people's minds, you know? And like all the kids signed up and, you know, drew a comic that, where they tried to understand somebody else's point of view. And one of the students came up to me like a year later and they're like, yeah, that's the, that's the scariest I've ever seen you, Jersey. You're usually like really sweet and kind. But... <laughs> but uh, for for me, it's like it's like there's a call to action baked into that. Like, well, nothing matters, does it? Nothing matters. Well, I mean, maybe identity matters to you. And if you want to identify as a cartoonist, then, and I've done this with my students too, where I'll have them sit down on the floor, crisscross applesauce, even if they're teenagers and they get really uncomfortable. They're like, oh God, what's he making me do? I'm like, okay, well, you know, if you're gonna be a cartoonist, then you're entering a tribe, and we all know each other in our tribe, and we have certain uh, codes of conduct in our tribe, and what we do. And I start listing, you know, positive behavior. Uh, and I talk about, you know, we support each other, we reinforce each other, and we try to lift each other up, and we try to understand one each other, or one another. And I say, does anybody have a problem with that? If anybody has a problem with that, there's the door. You can walk out right now, you know? And the, the, the teenagers are all squirming, you know, because they're like, oh, God, he's making me think about, like, you know, being a responsible citizen. I hate this. But, you know, uh, what it does is it creates this ritual of saying, like, we're all in this together, even if they're not totally signing up to it the first day, right? And usually by the sure. end of class, they are all... You know, they, they, there's at least an implicit understanding that we're all in this together. So I feel like saying, like, nothing matters is a way of saying it's all too big. I can't process it. Uh, and so I'm going to shrug my shoulders and say, what's the use? To which I say, okay, well, let's break it down and try to make it manageable so we can at least find something that we care about. And for all one right. of my students, Very it cool. was the Emoji Movie. Like, this one student, he was so into the Emoji Movie, he wrote, like, a 12-page paper on it. I'm like, okay, well, that, that matters to you. Well, let's talk about why it matters to you, right? <laughs> Mm. Where they are, so. Mm -hmm. I had a problem with the no. Was it the emoji movie? There was a movie that they did around the same time, where the characters were all these shapes, and the black character was shaped like turd. Oh, that was that was probably emo no. The turd in the emoji movie was oh, Patrick Stewart, my. wasn't it? Was it? No, then it's a different movie. Uh, I had to bring it up because I was thinking. I hope that's not the movie <laughs> I'm thinking of, and it's not. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay. But even if it's Ernest Goes to Camp, it's like, I'm going to meet you where you are, and I'm going to try to talk about what matters to you. Like, for um, one of my students, it was this game called Danganronpa. Have you guys heard of this? No. Mm -mm. Um, Rob? No? That's no. we're 0 for 3. I didn't know it either. So Danganronpa, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to summarize it. I'm, I'm summarizing it as a man who has a gray beard who is born in the 70s, right? So, like, I'm, I'm of an age. Uh, and I'm probably going to get some of those details wrong, but it's 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 a, a, a game slash visual novel where the premise is this this crazy demonic teddy bear kidnaps these high school students and locks them in a building and says the only way out is if uh, you you have to escape by murdering everybody else and not getting caught. And so it's just kind of like a icky That's premise. Like saw. And, yeah, kind of. It, this but it's Christmas not... on Lifetime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Oh, no, not like, another one. <laughs> so, like, when they're describing it to me, they're describing it with this, like, sort of, like, subversive, like, yeah, I'm not supposed... To, like, I know this is going to upset you that I'm saying this because you're Jersey Droz, you're very soft and sweet. And I'm like, well, look, can, you, can you play some of it in front of me? I want to see what this is about. And then they start showing me the game. And I'm like, oh, this is just like junior high and high school where it's all about, like, being, you know, social climbing and, you know, uh, like, hierarchical positioning and not revealing anything about yourself and having a crush on somebody. And if you get caught by your friends, you die, right? And I was like, okay, I get it. Yeah, totally makes sense. <laughs> and I'm like, that character's funny, you know, and, and I made them realize that the... They could trust me in that environment to express those ideas, which means that now they're going to trust me when I start saying, and Lone Ranger's cool, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> he traps you in a house with a teddy bear that you have to kill. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Works for me. Works for me. Now, yeah, I, I, I said, you know, I do something like that with my students where I do try to establish it's a safe place, and you can bring anything to the table. How I react to it is something else, but it's a safe place. You can bring it up. And so sometimes they, you know, they test you. Yeah. And I'll you know, yeah, look at it. Well, you don't really agree with that, do you? I said, no, not really. But okay, let's go forward with, you know, you know that sort of thing. Or um, I'll say, okay, so that reminds me of, and I'll share something from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s with them. They go, really? I said, yeah, there, there was life before you. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. So I try, I try and use a disarming bit of humor within the context of the conversations 
Because sometimes, yeah, we talk about some heavy duty things in a cinema studies class or a comics class mm -hmm. or a writing class. Yeah, because you do want to understand the kind of stories that attract you, the kind of stories that you can't forget, the kind of stories you want to tell. Why do they affect you? How do they work? You got to be open to discussing those age appropriate. Yes, but nevertheless, you've got to have those conversations. Yeah. It's um it's yeah, that we're probably getting close to uh uh yeah, a break time, right? Yeah, we are. It's um yeah, it it's the the safe sp uh, that hope, the question that that launched us off into all this, it's um it, you know, let's see, does reality matter and whatnot and the the it's there's so many angles on it there's the you've you got the individuals who who feel like they're alone they feel like their story is not connected to other stories or whatnot too and then it if if, you know, if we do our jobs well and in, in trying to you know it's just point out something that already exists that we're we are wired to relate to each other mm. and there's going to be something that will connect and we just we will you know hopefully skillfully find that thing. I mean that's like the powerful story that you yeah. shared, Alex. Yeah. Oof. Um, like the as as alien as we want to feel, we're not. Mm. Uh, mm. Very true. Very true. Yeah. So that's on our side when you want to make a connection. There you go. You don't know me, Rob. The world's never seen me before, and I'm I'm the, the most <laughs> unique worldview that's ever been. Which is true. Things are so unfair extent. for me. You don't get what <laughs> is unfair. <laughs> yeah, yeah wow. like, yeah. When, when Chris, when you told me that like your classroom was like, yeah, reality doesn't exist. You make your own reality. I just immediately saw Jack Webb in my head, like looking down a hippie in an old episode of Dragnet. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, now there was these they're adorable little kids with this. You know, this little, sh all right, they're 15, 16, 17, but they had this little shake on the head like, ah, oh, how does he not know this? And I was just, wow. And, you know, part of, part of being a teacher is you measure where the class is and you move them forward. Yep. This was a very unique and energizing experience uh, that I hadn't anticipated. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm ready to, you know, I'm I think ready to great. see where this goes. Yeah, I, I think it's great you're that kind of teacher to where you didn't go off on them. Yeah. Or start so well, far. I'm not saying I didn't go off. <laughs> I, think, I mean, the I class, mean, the last 20 minutes of class, of class is like, wait, wait, wait. I mean, that's not the point. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I kind of said, okay, so if reality doesn't matter, I can go on social media right now. And talk about you and your mom. Is that right? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Or I could make a lie about you and say you cheat on tests. Wait a minute. That's not. Ah, so reality does matter. <laughs> yeah. There are lines of reality we yeah. can and cannot cross. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah, That's I good. did kind of go, you know, uh, as politely as possible. But it was, it was. Uh, it was a moment. It was <laughs> definitely a moment. And so soon we'll go to another moment. <laughs> well, speaking of which, it, so are you guys okay with maybe switching gears and talking about like this idea of finding more opportunities to celebrate uh, our yes. work? in your town, bro. You, know, this, yes. you invited us uh, over. I'd like a little more coffee if you don't mind. But you know. And I'm willing to celebrate. All yeah. we've got is Sanka. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> cool in the gang. <laughs> celebrate good times. Okay. Sanka. Sanka Whenever you're much. ready, sir. But All don't right. you guys have... A moment that you have to share? Yes. 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 We're going to thank some people we who do. make this show possible, and those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Yes, patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, hey, I believe in Jersey, I believe in Rob, and I want to help make their project more sustainable, how can I do it, though? Uh, well, you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash lean into art. And I want to thank five people who have been doing exactly that. First up, Dave Say. Thank you, Dave, for believing in us and what we do. Uh, hey, you, yeah, Dave. <laughs> you can find Dave Say on Twitter <laughs> at Dave Say, the creator of the Emergent Task Planner, which I use every day. Thank you, Dave. Also, Rachel Ross. You can find Rachel on Twitter at NYC Terrace, longtime supporter of the show. Thank you, Rachel, for believing in us. And India Swift, amazing animator. You can find India on Twitter at Old Swifty. 
and Carrie Goble Billick, one of our biggest boosters. You can find Carrie on Twitter at Mushin Girl. You can also find Carrie in the Lena Tark Discord, which we'll talk about later. And finally, mm-hmm. Spencer Hallam. Thank you, Spencer, for believing in us and what we do. And you could join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art where you will find every show we make as well as the extra leans the shows we record only for people who support us on patreon those posts go up once a month and they become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place where only fellow leaners are hanging out once again that's patreon.com slash lean into art thank you to everybody who supports us there it means a lot to us it really does thank you so much wow wow <laughs> So look, I'm sorry. I'm gonna say it again. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I I listen to a lot of old radio, like the old Roy Rogers show, where they do all the ad reads in the show. P O S T post. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got them from my library. Uh, but yeah, they they do all the like the in in show reads. You know, like tell your mother to go to the store tomorrow. I just love how not yes. urgent it is. <laughs> Yeah, yep, yep. yep. I've, I've got. I collect a lot of old radio shows myself. Roy, I have Roy. I have Hoppy. I have Shadow. I have a lot of those things. And yes, the announcers are amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. All right. I so uh, like I, the blue coal ads. Blue coal. Yeah, the Shadow. Blue coal. Right. I'm sorry. Blue coal. Let's not get too old for you guys. Now. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Well, I wasn't there to, with Roy Rogers either, but. Uh, all right, so the music is now playing, which means we're now in the second half of the show. And I want I want to ask Rob to cue this one up because I feel like this is one where I mean, Rob, you've got the board behind you that we all were all talking about that inspired this topic. Sure. <laughs> uh, I feel like I accidentally did something that I do on purpose uh, normally, where I uh, I set curiosity traps, and you know, here we are, we join this uh, this call to do these this this two podcast series crossover event. And I happen to have my dry erase board that's it was kind of off camera, not fully on camera. It wasn't meant to be a prop, but you know what? Curiosity uh, of of our uh, collaborators here, um, Alex and Chris, we started talking about, oh, what's on the whiteboard? Because I like to unpack ideas and explore thoughts and whatnot too. And it's it's uh, there's something about the physicality of a big thing to write on. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. Separate topic though. What's on the whiteboard is is um, celebration and. I'm trying to work through examples I've seen, things I've done in the past to recognize just moments of victory, moments of like small tasks, getting things done. Sometimes when you when I have a day of that, that's kind of a gauntlet of like, I've got multiple things to ship today. That's a kind of day that I really want to have some energy coming back at me and being like, all right, I did it and that was worth it. And I noticed that even for big, big or small things, I'm I'm more just like I grab another task off the pile, and then the day is done, and I feel fine. But I'm not doing it as much, you know. I'm not dancing and shaking my butt or, or like woohooing or or fist pump or victory donut or any of these things I've done before. And uh, I want to get better at that because I think you know you I, you lose um, you lose an opportunity for just. Um, like feeling good and grateful about what you can do. And, uh, you know, there is a good fortune that you've built this skill, you create some things and, uh, that, that, that's worth noticing and noticing with a warm glow in your heart and, and saying like, uh, anyway, so like that, that's what this became is this exercise of, of, um, gathering things from, from, you know, friends, people on the internet and all that stuff and even my own reflective exercise of uh like actions i do to to, like what does it look like when i celebrate um like stories that i tell and this is all positive reinforcement i'm trying purposefully trying to not go down the path of um demons and doubts i'm that's a that's the discount dungeons and dragons that's no fun it makes you sad um and (laughs) <laughs> Pause for laugh. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're all awesome. it in, right? So we like the title. We like the title, "Demons and Doubt." I like it. Um, anyway, so like, so I, I'm guessing that I'm not alone in this, and you know, thinking the idea of, of just I want to be more skillful with celebrating, big and small. And so I don't know what what do you folks think about this. 101%, I agree with you. I told you uh, when we first started, you know, reading your room and, and going, what's that? What's that? You know, that 
it as a happenstance this morning when I put I put up on Facebook uh, just a simple phrase that went through my mind something that I had to more often start to acknowledge the good that's come into my life. It was just something that said, put that up there because that's how you feel right now. And I think it's absolutely right. It's not only it's not only something we should do for ourselves and as you put it, get better at celebrating some of our wins or our accomplishments or, you know, whatever. But I think it's also very beneficial to remind yourself that you have had wins. Because sometimes that's where the strength to continue comes from. Yeah, I, I actually periodically have to reread my resume because I forget some of the stuff I've done. And mm. as I'm approaching a new project, I'm going, gee, I don't know if I can do this. And I'm, you know, this is worse. I know. No. And you read, you read the resume, you read this list of stuff. You know, you know I've already done this nine times. Geez, what, what am I worrying about? I know this. I got this. <laughs> you know, but sometimes in the cloud of things that happen, we forget or we, we get caught up in that. So I think it's absolutely great to celebrate personally or otherwise. Those little, the little wins or the big wins, but just, yeah, to acknowledge, hey, it worked. Great. I can keep going. So, well, why, um, all right, so is there a point that you've, uh, so do you know someone who's awesome at this, and have you ever been awesome at this? Alex is pretty awesome at this. <laughs> I, am, hmm. I am not awesome at this. <laughs> I'm a practicing I'm awesome person. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I really am. I'm it. practicing it. It's it's a it's a it's a habit I'm developing. Not not as in you know a bad habit. It's it's a good habit to try and remind myself that I've done good or that I've completed something and that this is moving forward and this is positive. Yeah. I think I think in in, in I, I don't know if it's if it's human nature or what, but I find that a lot of people remember. The losses, or the, or, or the, 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 the things that don't go well, they remember those things far quicker than they right. remember the positive, and I think that needs to be reversed. Um, I'll correct myself. The, the public Chris Ryan, the the one that shows up at conventions and stuff, that version of me is really good. At celebrating the positive, I uh, will talk to other people. I'll interview other people. I'll uh, um, be interested in um, the panel, the contribution to the panel. The what's this person writing? What's that person writing? Um, but I grew up in an Irish household where if you uh, if you celebrated yourself too much, you were too big for your britches. So you know, so it's uh, it's an ongoing experience of overcoming that you know um i do i'm coming out of a uh, a period where i had f forgotten um uh the public me <laughs> or uh that i had a, a you know the novels that i had uh written uh had met with some people who really enjoyed them and that dawning of that, that realization, that remembering, that re-embracing of, of those things is starting to happen again. Um, matter of fact, in preparation for this show today, um, I had pitched a, a, a question and I gave Alex some background. And he was like, you know, please remember that list of things you just did that you gave me. Because uh, clearly I don't always remember that, you know, so that's one of the things that self-celebration is important, acknowledging the things you do and the, you know, uh, you were talking about curiosity traps, there's doubt traps as well, you know, don't compare yourself to the New York Times bestseller list or, you know, the person who won the, um, you know, this award or that award, that's, that's really not what it's about, right? It's about being uh, the best conduit to communication that you can be, whether it's in your creative life or your educational life or your regular life, right? To, you know, every day you, do, you try and do the best you can uh, uh, to put forth what you think the world should be, 
right? I guess that's what, I guess maybe that's the bridge. I got to tell those kids who say reality doesn't matter. You know, I'm learning a lot in this episode, man. <laughs> Lean into art. It's a place. <laughs> well, it's a safe, it, this is a safe place to learn and think things, think about hard things. This is great. Yeah. Works for me. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Another, another aspect of this, I think, is worth, uh, at least for me, it's worth reminding myself is I have uh, a battle with an internal narrative of it's not about me. It's not like so like uh, when I first started teaching, I remember one of my very first students I ever taught like went off and, and started to work in comics like right in as they were in college. And somebody said to me like, wow, you must be really proud. I'm like, hey, hey, hey I don't get to say that. I am grateful that I was there to help them when they needed help and, and, and be their cheerleader. But I have no access to their 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 accomplishment. That was them. I'm, I can't be pr I can be happy for them, but I can't be proud of them. It's not about me. Don't make it about me. Right. I was I was very much like any like little tiny trophy. Anybody wanted to push my way. I was like, get that thing away from me because <laughs> that's saying that it's about me. You know, you obviously never saw Mr. Holland's opus. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> no, I did see Mr. Holland's opus. And I remember when I was in my 20s, it, that that movie like terrified me. Right. Because I thought it was like I took it. The, the other way around like he threw away his entire life <laughs> oh wow it's, right wow. yeah yeah i thought we were celebrating this episode what right well so so in in, in over the years Prince I've, of I've, darkness indeed <laughs> yeah. i'm just saying like, when i was in my 20s and i was a much more uh, ferocious young man in terms of what I wanted out of my career. You know, it's like, I've got dreams. I'm going to be a great comic book artist someday. And like, this story is about a guy who gave it up to like help some other people do stuff, I guess. Right. Like I, I have a different perspective. I've been teaching 10 years. Right. Um, I know. Look at, look at Alex squirm, man. <laughs> oh God. Okay. I was in my twenties. I'll tell you what though. The, the jersey uh, we never knew. <laughs> Yeah. The the thing you learn though, uh, at, at least when I uh, when I started teaching, I I took uh, the teaching job on a bet. Worst reason to ever become a teacher, and that's for really? another episode sometime. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I had been uh, covering the Bronx crime, you know, crime and politics, which in the Bronx is often the same thing. But uh, a lot of uh, street crime and uh, dead kids, because it was the crack wars. Wow. And when I took this job to really be a, a shortened version of this what i didn't realize was that i was walking into a building of living breathing dynamic human beings and it was the most surprising and the greatest high i ever experienced and 29 years later i still get that yeah. every day i walk into a school yeah. and that's the trade-off you know yeah and uh, I I wouldn't trade for anything, you know. Oh, hopefully, same. you know, you can still be creative. But God, there's yeah, there's been. so much there. Yeah, yeah no, no, totally no, agree. So, but like before, I, I horrified Alex, uh, which was like, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that to my grave. It's like the whole, the whole. <laughs> I, I I made I've made Chris Ware laugh at one point, and I horrified Alex Simmons. So now I get to I, I have real bragging rights in this world. Um, Damn. no, but I, I backtracked, <laughs> I tried to figure out like, why was I so allergic to getting praise on me? <laughs> right? Like, why was I like, get it off, get it off, you know? And, <laughs> and, and I think, I think part of it is, I think part for at least speaking from my own biography is that it goes back to this idea of like, you're just trying not to drown when you make stuff and you lose all touch with like, okay, what did I really do here? I don't even know because every page presents you with a thousand choices and navigating those choices is such a whirlwind of sometimes emotion, sometimes just like hard thought. Um, so when you get out the other side, it is super easy to lose track of what you actually did. And so what are you celebrating, right? Like I, I have this day, Rob and I talk a lot on the show about this thing called the emergent task planner, which is like this day planner sort of thing where I track everything that I'm doing on a day to day basis. And I even like color code it. I keep track of like how long each page takes me. I do like a reflection at the end of each day of like, okay, I spent this much time on penciling, this much time on inking, this much time on thumbnailing. So I have that data yet still, it's difficult. Oh, there's Alex. Same thing. Wow. So, but it's still it's still super easy to lose touch with what's actually happening while you're doing the thing. So, all I was trying to get at was like, it's understandable and forgivable that we would lose touch with like celebrating ourselves because to celebrate yourself, you also have to know what you actually did. Yeah. Nice. Well, you know, I have I have what I call and just 
it really when you said this jersey, I just I just cracked up inside. I have what I've called for years a Lone Ranger syndrome. Yeah, here, here's my little Lone Ranger. See. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. I I was constantly, even as a teenager, trying to do good, help people, all that, and then yeah. get away from get anything remotely there. close to a compliment. Right. Yeah. Because the Lone Ranger and Tano, they did the right thing, and then they wrote off before yeah. folks even can find out what their name was. Right. Don't you know, know who, who was are. that masked man? What masked man? I didn't see him. You know. So to me, it was great until, and just to show you how slow self-fulfillment or self-development or self-awareness can be two years ago sitting here in my space my studio space pressuring myself through a writing project and trying to figure out, and i got bill pressures and all this other stuff and i'm sitting there thinking you know yeah you just do the right thing you've been doing the right thing to, you know the lone ranger is it wait a minute the lone ranger had a silver mine he was bruce wayne in the west <laughs> He could afford. To, he could afford to do all that stuff and ride off and not worry about rewards or thank yous or anything. He didn't need it. Oh <laughs> Holy smoke! <laughs> you know? and, and you know, it wasn't about the money. It was about recognizing that you did something and people benefited from it, and you can feel good about that. And this You're is something allowed. It's okay. You mm -hmm. are humble. I'm already humble. I don't have to work at it. Yeah. <laughs> this is th what's funny. I had a very similar journey, and it was thanks to Rob. Actually, Rob was the one who kind of like very gently slapped me in the back of the head and was like, "Dude, look at look at what you're saying." Uh, so my another character for me was um, the character of He Man from the ni 19 early 80s uh, show. I have the power. Wow, wow, there you go. And it, yeah. he, he was he was written by people who were big Lone Ranger and Zorro fans. So a lot of that ethos is in the series. And this is the same kind of thing where he helps people and the king will be like, wow, we're so grateful to have you. And he's like, I'm just glad nobody got hurt. And then he gets on his battle cat and rides away, right? Mm -hmm. and, and he never sticks because he has secret identity. So he never sticks around to receive any praise. And I was telling Rob about this. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's like that's I feel like an obligation to like just hightail it out as soon as everything's OK. And Rob's like, yeah, well. He Man's secret identity is Prince Adam. His dad's the king. <laughs> He's got resources. <laughs> He's like, you are an artist who has to engage and trade in the world in order to make this sustainable. And in We're order court jesters. <laughs> we are not kings or princes. We're court jesters. And the court jester is allowed to take a bow. There you go. <laughs> right. We can gather people around the fire and be griots. We can do that. We're allowed. And we can we can rejoice in the satisfaction that the people that we pull around us through our books, our art, or whatever enjoyed it. You know, yeah. it's 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 sometimes it's a hard lesson to learn that a thank you is not an ugly word. <laughs> well, and and it's um it, it's such a powerful me mechanism, right? Because you want to build your success you don't want to tear your sex success down or just wear it out where it just mm. sort of you know falls apart due to lack of caring maintenance right where um both so even alone right it's it's i think it's important to recognize because i get into the that that flow of you know next thing next thing um all right i'm gonna i'm going to you know um, well, I'm working on my game for this part, and I'm working on a new, new message thing for my business, and now I'm doing this thing and that thing, and like I'll run a gauntlet, and and it's sort of like vacuum packed and and end to end tasks, and then I'm like, well, now I'm now it's time to make supper or whatever, and it's just like, just stop and like again, like shake your butt, like be happy, they notice and appreciate that you're here right now able to do these things and love your own gifts. And mm. uh, that is great on, in, on its own. And then if, if someone wants to celebrate and love your gifts too, don't push them away and all that, right? Welcome this, pre as awkward as it might be, it's sit in that awkwardness and it's fine. Like you'll yeah, be okay, you're, you'll survive. Yeah, exactly. I ideally, do that. myself again. Yeah. You had, um, I don't know if it was Rob or Jersey. Jersey's just enjoying himself too damn much. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, you had a, uh, there was a question that came up early and I see about um, how do we find, and I'm just, I'm just going to 
tear this a little bit off and pop it in here because I think it belongs. How do we find, as, as artists who are also trying to make a living as artists, how do we find our audience? And I think this is one of the ways. In celebrating what's been accomplished and celebrating the people that enjoy what you do and celebrating the people that come to see, what are you celebrating? You know, you build a, a rhythm, you build a wave uh, or ripple, whatever size of it you want to see, that spreads out and alerts others to the fact, oh, something good is happening here. Something appreciative is happening here. Something that has moved my friend from this to this. I want to ask my friend what that was. You know, and let me get on let me get on board with that. Let me become a part of that. It's, it's partly how some of us have, you know, attracted our audiences to our podcasts. It's somehow we're having we're sharing, we're having a good time doing it, and it's resonating with enough folk that they've told some other folks and they found us. So I think being aware that a, we do what we do well enough. Now, that's, that's not really the compliment. The compliment is we do what we do so well that we do attract people, whatever the numbers. And we should be happy about that. And we should celebrate that and let them do that. And, you know, as, as the old uh, commercial used to go, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know, build that way. It's uh, one of the ways, anyway. I think part of the... Uh, the the brother or sister part to that answer is that part of the things that uh, uh, you do in Lean Into Art and we do in telling the damn story is that we do talk about the struggles. We do talk about the questions we have. And I I get from people that that's a relief. Oh, you suck. You think you suck too. Yeah. We all do, right? We all struggle. And, and to kind of bring it into the celebrate part, once you know that everybody goes through that, it's such a relief that it feels like a celebration. You know, that, wow, from the bestseller to the newbie, we all think that, we all go through that part of the process. Um, there's a, a mixed media, I feel terrible, that I'm not going to remember her uh, her name on Instagram, but it's a, um, it's a mixed media thing where they consult on contracts or, or creativity uh, and give articles and uh, advice and stuff as part of their Instagram. Um, and I think it was just yesterday she was talking about when you realize that everybody feels that same it's easier for you to get through it too. And that's part of the celebration is to let us know, let everybody know that we're all part of that same tribe. We're all part of that same process, you know, I'm not really and, alone. Yeah. So you don't get lost. There's, I think some of the uh, people get lost in the negativity and they don't allow themselves over to the positivity, you know, uh, or they like, feel they ostracize themselves because they think they're weird. They think they're not good enough or whatever, but no, Hey, you know, all's welcome. And yeah, well, also, weird is how we got here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I, I think there's only two choices in life. It's weird or boring. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Weird is how we got here. <laughs> okay, I'm putting that down with the other one. Many Roads to Hope and Weird is How We've Got Here. Two top titles from this, from this mashup, from this podcast mashup. Order the t-shirt today. Yeah. <laughs> Again, you guys are running this. We're in your house, you know, yeah, so yep. whatever you want to say. Yeah, so um, we're coming up on another break. So usually what we do on the show at this point uh, is we try to come up with some kind of final thought, like, a, like three to five minutes of of talking about like closing up this whole thing. So while I do the ad read, uh, if you guys want to, you know, be a little pensive and think about like, what, how would you summarize this adventure? We've been on for two episodes. Uh, sound good. Sure. Sounds like a plan. Yes. Okay. So in two minutes, we'll come back with final thought. But before we do that, we got to thank some more people who make the show possible. Those people happen to be, us, we make the show possible. We make all sorts of stuff. We engage with the stuff we make and think hard about it. And then we bring all those thoughts into this thing called Lean Into Art. And the thing that I hope you will check out right now today is uh, Boulder and Fleet Mining for Trouble, which you can find at books.jdros.com. What is it? It's, well, it's 
furry animals talking like and acting like people, but it's an adventure story that explores the idea of the role of force in if you go off into the world to be an adventurer and protect people, odds are you're going to find conflict. And how do you solve that conflict? Do you punch everybody down? Well, if you're a super powerful bear like Boulder, maybe that might be the thing you want to do. But he doesn't like to. He likes to make friends. He doesn't actually like to make enemies. But his, his partner is this bird named Fleet who is uh, very ambitious and wants to be the most ad- uh, famous adventurer of all time. And she thinks that that is how you solve these problems is to beat people down. So there's a little bit of conflict between the two heroes, but they love each other very much and they find out how to find uh, the middle ground between the two of them. And in the story of Mining for Trouble, they encounter a group of mineral girls who live off of precious metals. So what do they do? They take over a mine and they beat up all the miners. And so our heroes have to find a peaceful solution to the problem, but not before the mineral girls uh, assault them with all their various mineral superpowers. You can find it once again at books.jdros.com. Rob, you do this thing we call coaching. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, okay. So coaching is, it's about, it's about skillfully exploring and navigating your own decisions. And you can end up in that situation, whether you're, you're working through maybe different career opportunities or trying to uh, decide about your next creative project. And you're working things through and you don't have to do that alone. You can hire a coach. In fact, you can try coaching for free. It's super easy. Just go to this easy URL that'll bring you to the site is robcoach.me and check it out. Sign up for a discovery session and you'll get to experience uh, what coaching is like and if I'm the right coach for you and all that, which is just about someone who is listening to you really deeply and at the times when it's useful, asking you a question to help you continue your own process. It's not about prescribing. It's not about uh, telling you what to, you know what to do or what have you. It's 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 just an upgrade for your own thinking process, and you can give it a try. Just go to robcoach.me. And it the other thing we hope you will check out is the Lean Into Art Discord. There will be an invite link in the show notes for this episode. And what is that? That is a it's a forum. It's a it's essentially a forum that you can engage with on your phone or on your desktop. And there are three public channels that you can participate in, as well as three channels for the people who support us on Patreon, including Castle Level Up, where you can post works in progress that you need some uh, feedback from from your fellow leaners and us. And then also. Um, Oh, what's the other channel, Rob? There's Castle Level Up. And the, oh, Gentle Town. Gentle Town. Yep. Gentle Town is where you want... If It's okay to ask for a high five. You made something that you're excited about, you want to share it with everybody, and maybe get a pat on the back and add a boy or add a girl or add a you... You can go to Gentletown for that. And then finally, there's a social channel only for the p- folks who support us on Patreon. I posted some pictures that, from the zoo last night when I was out doing research at uh, the petting zoo, uh, taking pictures of pigs for my <laughs> next book where uh, pickles might have an arch enemy. Um, so once again, that's the Lean Into Art Discord. You can just search on Discord for our, our server, or you can find the um, invite link in the show notes for this episode. Okay. Are we ready for final thought? Yeah, yeah, coach, uh, send me in. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, you, you know, it's 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 interesting because we've talked about celebration and we've talked about in over the two episodes, we've talked about celebration, we've talked about um who we are as artists, finding our voice, um and and really sort of connecting with people and exploring our feelings and uh recognizing other people's and so that we sort of discover that we're not alone in all this. And for me, one of the things I'll say is you, it, it's, I'm trying to, I was trying to hold on to a particular phrase that you said, Robin, not Rob, I'm sorry, New Jersey, and it's gone now because you talk so quickly. So I'll just go back to uh, what I was initially going to say, which is that I, I feel like there are a lot of awake people out there, and I use that term that's very popular right now, but I use it in this particular fashion. I think there's a lot of people that are looking for ways to not just survive, but to, to blossom, to, to, to better their lives, to, to grow, and maybe make a little extra room for someone else, whether it's, it's their, their companion or their children, uh, or like, you know, with some of the folks I know, they, they teach, they, they, so their children or their family are their students. And I think they work very hard at that. And I think what shows like this do is they shine a light on that. They shine a light on the positive. I think it's necessary for us to not only know that we're not alone, but know that there are patches of oasis here and there. There, there are like spirits and like minds. Um, 
someone was saying to me the other day about you know the the uh, being the the only African American man on this group. Uh, so they were they were talking to me about a, a particular black experience and about slavery and how the slaves had battle to to get to freedom and so forth and i remember thinking yeah you're right this is true absolutely not and and don't forget the non-blacks who helped because once again the the moment we absolutely separate our supporters from what we're trying to do we're alone again and i don't think people need to constantly go back to the loner position there's definitely us and them in some situations but there's also us and that's that's the thing. It's remembering the collaboration and cooperation and community, three great C's right there, um, mm. happen every day. Somewhere, every day, every hour, it's happening. And we just need to be reminded of that. And so I'll blow my horn one time, and then I'll leave you guys to just share your points of view here. It took me two years, but on October 9th of this year, um, I spearheaded, or I was the host of, what we call the International Comic Center Conference. It was a little online, hour and a half experience, where I brought together artists and directors of comic and cartooning centers in four different countries, online, to talk about what each of them and their, their little communal group have been doing to support young people and, and others, young at heart, if you will, uh, in their quest to improve their art, to to make a, a living at it, to to grow better and stronger in their skills, and to feel that there were people who cared. And so we came together and we shared those experiences, and we will be doing this again. And, you know, a lot of folks have said to me, how can that happen? You know, they're, they're from this country and that country. So it happens when good people of like mind decide it will. And I think that's what this show has also helped me feel is that we came together to do this. I think that the two episodes were just not only fun and informative, but they were powerful. And that's because we individually and together decided we're going to make this happen. Everybody's smiling. For those of you who are listening to this as an audio experience, we're, just, we're all we're sitting here just that. grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how do you, how do you follow that? <laughs> uh, yes and yes. <laughs> Chris? So, uh, before this, I was doing uh, household chores because that's that's part of the existence, too. And I was putting back a bookshelf uh and putting it was mostly my wife's books. She's a U2 uh, aficionado. I am as well, but not nearly as mystical or uh, spiritual about it as she is. And uh, and listening to Alex and and reflecting on what these two episodes kind of uh, bring to mind is uh, I'll go to a quote. I'm going to take a risk and go to a quote from Bono. Um, in the last tour, one of the points he was trying to make was that there is no them. There's just us. And in a time when too many forces want to divide us, you know, I think I'm starting to feel and starting to see that people are turning to each other, you know, from a, I saw it in a Wendy's commercial when they were talking about wanting unity. And, um, I'm starting to see it in, uh, creatives and in businesses and in and in schools uh where we're starting to move past hopefully it'll catch on you know it'll be the rage but we're moving past what divides us and starting to explore what unifies us and the energy today of the four minds exploring together and getting to yes together like, yes, we'll talk about this. Yes, we'll exchange ideas as energizing and refreshing. And it is uh, hopeful. It does fill me with the possibility that I can, you know, channel some of this to uh, that wayward class 
you know, that <laughs> police reality may not matter, you know. So uh, I'm I'm coming out of this grateful and excited. And hopefully we can do this dance again sometimes. Cause I, I oh, thought please, it was fantastic. Please. We'll bring the music. <laughs> <laughs> That would be yeah, that'd be wonderful. I this was uh this was a uh, a sheer joy and uh a really f- uh you 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 two bring a lot of uh, uh I think constructive challenge that because uh, I felt I felt usefully uncomfortable at multiple times today, so, <laughs> which I appreciate that. That is fantastic. Okay. Thank that, you. That, that, that is well. You know, one of the things I did, I I watch, you know, watching to see what everyone's doing, and uh, the level of your deep thought was fascinating to me. You know, you consider, you seem to consider everything, and um, I didn't, I didn't realize how real the whiteboard was. You know, until I saw it playing again across your face again and again during these sessions. You know. Jersey's over here having a great time, and his thoughts are coming quick and all that stuff. And and Rob is uh, contemplating and listening. Man, I've never seen someone listen so hard. It was fantastic. Yeah, so that was, I was impressive. I want to I want to listen like Rob. <laughs> Another title. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that that that's a that's worthy really aspiration. Kind. I will say. I've been we're doing this show with Rob for a long time, and yeah, I've I've learned a lot about listening through watching him listen uh, and watching his pen move. And like, oh, I just said something. What did I say that made his pen move? So yeah, uh, and and I, if I can quote Rob one more time, um, the thing that I remember he said uh, it was almost. Three years ago, uh, exactly, was was a Twitter post. I don't know if you remember this, Rob, but you said, we need to work harder to understand that we need each other. You know, yeah. uh, I think that's that's like and that's that's guy that's been like a guiding principle for me. It's like, OK, well, if all else fails, if I can just convince whoever's in the room that we all need each other, you know, uh, mm. th- then we'll be a little bit better. Mm. So that's so. beautiful. All right. Right. Everyone's going through their own struggles, and then you guys are talking. About, I feel like we need a big podcast group hug, baby. <laughs> Whatever that looks like. Yes. That's, <laughs> it looks like what we just did for two hours. Yeah. I yeah. That's true. That's that true. All right. You're so, soaking in it. All right. I want to say thank you guys so much for making this possible and oh, showing up and giving us uh, yeah. so much of your time. And uh, I want to implore the leaners who are listening to this: do if you have not yet, go subscribe to Tell the Damn Story. You will not be sorry. There are 109 episodes of the show, and they are all very good. I, if I were to underline one of them, there was an episode you guys did a few months back where actually Chris, you were showing up talking about not feeling it. You know, it was like you were, you were, it was, you were talking about struggling with it. You were struggling with health. You were struggling with like really intense allergies and you were struggling with just not wanting to be in the writer's seat. And that was a very challenging hour to listen to, but it was so fruitful. It was so, it wasn't as simple as, oh, he, he has, he has stuff that goes on too. It made me introspective, saying like, "Well, what am I struggling with that I'm not acknowledging? What am I struggling with that I'm not like accepting and embracing and sharing with people who could potentially help me?" Right? Uh, that was like the biggest takeaway I got was like, "I don't ask for help enough," you know. So um, it will. I I will say it's like the the woods of Lothlorien. You will not leave unchanged if you subscribe to tell That's the damn story. Great. Great. Thank you so very Whoa. much. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow! Oh, oh dang! Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And it, I tell you, if if the uh, the tell a damn story audience has not found you yet, they should after these two episodes. <laughs> Our episode lit. We left it on a cliffhanger, so they'd have to stop they by. Have to. But now, once they've seen this, they I think they have to stay. So <laughs> they have to keep better, coming you back. You better stock yeah. up your cupboards because you know another tool for the our belt. fans it- eat. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I think we should absolutely do this again. Yeah, please, please, awesome, please. Yeah. Okay. Please, baby, please. please. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for downloading, listening to uh, the Lean Heart cast. We record this show usually on Thursdays at noon Eastern time, 11 a.m. Central. We stream it live on twitch.tv slash lean into art, and then we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash lean into art and lean into art.com. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of lean into art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. Alex, where can we find and- you? 
Oh, sorry, Before Rob. I close oh, it oh, out. No, no, yeah. go Let's to have Rob. our guest close out their yeah. handles. We, we thought the same thing. Oh, yep. okay. Go, Chris. Uh, you can find me at Chris Ryan Writes on most platforms. <laughs> he, he's got it simple. So I'll just say that you can, if you really want to you know, reach out to me, you can find me on my website, SimmonsHereAndNow.com. Um, but I'm also on Instagram, uh, predominantly in, in my two capacities as a writer and a head of a children's uh, programming. So it's Kids Comic Con is, is one Instagram. So it's, it's um, you know, actually, I did that wrong. It's the Kids Comic Con is the actual program, but the, um, the uh, Instagram address is KCC for Kids. And so KCC, the number four kids. And the other one is very easy. It's Blackjack Adventures. There you go. <laughs> My head. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot going on. That's awesome. Okay. And. Okay. And so thank you both for being here once again. And I have been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger on places like Instagram. Okay. Nice. Ooh, I like that. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.